We want to show you some extraordinary pictures which came to us from the Vatican on what was, of course, an extraordinary day. Within hours of Pope Benedict announcing that he was to resign, take a look at this. Lightning struck St. Peter's Basilica. You can see it again now in slow motion. Extraordinary. It happened just before 6 o'clock in the evening, local time. So today is the third Sunday after Easter, and uh, the epistle is taken from the first epistle of St. Peter, chapter 2. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims to refrain yourselves from carnal desires, which war against the soul. Have in your conversation good among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by the good works which they shall behold in you glorify God in the day of visitation. Be ye subject therefore to every human creature for God's sake, whether it be to the king as excelling, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of the evildoers, and for the praise of the good. For so is the will of God that by doing well you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not as making liberty a cloak for malice, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy before God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the Gospel, in the name of the Gospel. <coughs> Taking that according to St. John chapter 16. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, A little while and you shall not see me, and again a little while and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said one to another, What is this that he saith to us? A little while and you shall not see me, and again a little while and you shall see me, and because I go to the Father. They said therefore, What is this that he saith? A little while. We know not what he speaketh, Jesus knew that they had a mind to ask him, and he said to them, Of this do you inquire amongst yourselves, because I said, A little while, and you shall not see me, and again a little while, and you shall see me. And men and men I say unto you, that you shall lament and weep, but the world shall rejoice. And you shall be made sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But when she hath brought forth a child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. So also you now indeed have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man shall take from you. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. <coughs> it's good to still be here in, in Sydney, and this afternoon I head up to, uh, to Brisbane. But uh, in any case, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Today, the third Sunday after Easter, and we begin to read in the Sacred Scripture, in the Breviary, the Book of Apocalypse. The very beginning of the Book of Apocalypse. And we begin to look towards the day of the Resurrection, I mean, rather, the day of the Ascension and the coming of Pentecost. We begin to turn the eyes, and we consider... The powerful words of St. John, St. Peter, the Apostles, St. Thomas, that when they went out into the world, we can liken our times, or getting very much likened to the times of our Lord Jesus Christ. When the Apostles went out, they remember St. Uh, John the Apostle is writing from the island of Patmos, 
And he is writing in the time when the whole of civilization is against our Lord Jesus Christ. The Roman civilization is killing all of those that are the followers of Christ. All Catholics are being put to death. Most of the apostles have already been killed. Consider the setting in which St. John writes about he who is, he who is to come, he who is the king, he who reigns. Our St. John speaks of power. When he writes his gospel, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was made nothing that has been made. St. John has, he is the beloved apostle, and being the beloved apostle, we can say that he is also the apostle with the deepest faith. He, has a, he sees clearly the victory of Christ and the power of Christ. But consider the setting. For us, it is easy to see the power of Christ and the victory of Christ because we look back over 2,000 years of Catholic history. We know about Catholic civilizations. We know about Catholic armies. We know about thousands and hundreds of thousands of churches throughout the world. We know about saints. We know about the history of the victory of Christendom. We know that one billion people on earth are Catholics, even if they're not even practicing their faith, the majority of them. We know that the influence of Christianity throughout the world we know it because we see the physical signs, even in our corrupt modern society, we see the physical effects and signs of our Christianity and of the good the Catholic Church has done. The existence of hospitals invented by the Catholic Church, of schools invented by the Catholic Church, even though they have all become corrupt. There's still the effects and residue of Christianity all around us. But when St. John spoke these words, he was in a house like this. And when St. Peter said Mass, he said Mass on a little wooden altar that they would set up and they would take down when Mass was over in case the Romans were coming. And he would say Mass before a few souls, down in the catacombs and in houses. And St. Peter standing in the catacombs while the Romans were searching for him up above. And St. John on the island of Patmos, about ready to be condemned to be boiled in oil. And then on all of the tri tribulations, and they say to, say to John, the last apostle to die, how did your fellow apostles live? Die? Well, let's see. Peter was crucified upside down. Uh, uh, Bartholomew, they took a knife to him and skinned him alive. Uh, you know, uh, Thomas, some guy threw a spear and hit him in the side. And, uh, you know, we're the followers of Christ. Well, why should I follow your religion when every one of you have died? Because that is our glory. And our king is going to reign. And our king does have power. And we will conquer the world. We consider the great faith of the apostles. The great faith. Now it always requires faith to believe in God. It always requires supernatural faith. But sometimes more faith is required than at other times. This is one of those times. We can see in many ways there are similarities between our difficult times and the times of Christ. We're back to masses and homes. Back to the whole world being against us, so to speak. Back to the fact that where, where is the visible sign of victory? The visible sign of victory is not there. We have only the promise of Our Lady that when things are at their worst, that will be the time of the victory. But we have to approach the battlefield of this world with faith. We have to approach the battlefield with complete confidence. And this is the way St. John approached it. And this is the way St. Peter approached it. This is the way St. Thomas approached it when he went to India. This is the way the apostles all approached it. They went by themselves out into the world, and went two by two out into the world, or by themselves out into the world, in order to bring Christ to souls and to conquer it. When St. Francis Xavier went to India, it was to conquer it. We have a sermon which should be more famous, but it's not as famous as it should be, of Bishop Dagger John Hughes in the 1840s in the United States. At that time, it was a time of the know-nothing riots. And Catholics were unpopular. Catholics, too many Catholics were beginning to migrate to the United States. There were too many Catholics migrating. And the, the nativists, they called themselves the nativists, they were against the migration of the Catholics. And they started to burn down Catholic churches. And they killed many Catholics. And there were riots in Louisville, Kentucky, my hometown, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and other places. And there were many Catholics being killed. In New York City, where there were more Catholics than anywhere else, there were no know-nothing riots. And the reason was because of Bishop Dagger John Hughes. He was an Irish bishop. And the Irish bishop, first he preached a public sermon. And he said, right now there are rumors. Rumors being spread that the Catholics are coming 
to conquer America. If the Catholics are coming in order to take this country and turn it into a Catholic country and make it under the reign of the Pope. They're going to make it a Papist country. I want it to be make it very clear here and now that these are not rumors. They are false rumors. If it's wrong to call them rumors, they are not rumors. It is a fact. We are here to conquer America. We are here to bring the whole of the church, the Catholic, the Catholic faith to America. And I don't want to hear any more about rumors. Nothing more about rumors. These are not rumors. Then Bishop Dagger John Hughes preached second through that sermon in St. Patrick's Cathedral, which is still under construction. He then went out to the bishop, to the mayor of New York City, who was a know-nothing. They called themselves a know-nothings because it was their code word. They would burn down a Catholic church. They would kill Catholics. There were many witnesses because they did it in public without uh, masks or anything. And there are many witnesses. The witnesses would come and say, this man murdered the priest, this man murdered the people, this man burned down the people inside the churches. And they would, and they would, the, the judge would say, I know nothing. And, they would, and the police officer would say, I know nothing. When they heard those two words, I know nothing, then that was the code word that the case was to be dropped. And so not one person was prosecuted. And then because of those two words, the code words, know nothing, they began to be called the know nothings. They called themselves the know nothings. And they even formed a know-nothing party in the United States government, which should be the name of every party. But nonetheless, a know-nothing party. And so, in any case, so that Bishop Dagger John Hughes went to the mayor of New York City, and he tell, talk, talked to him. He said, I'm coming to see you about these know-nothing riots. And the mayor said, the usual response, I'm sorry, but I know nothing about what you're talking about, because I know that you know nothing. I'm not coming here to ask you what you know. I'm coming to tell you what I know. And what I know is this. If one of my uh, Irish Catholics, or one of my Catholics is touched in New York City, if one window is broken in one church in New York City, I'm taking every Catholic in town and we're going to burn New York City to the ground. Just thought you might want to know. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> and he left. Not one window was broken. While they were killing Catholics and all in the other places, not one window was broken. He had complete confidence in the victory of the faith when it was not popular. Most of the other bishops, they were afraid. And they tried to say, many of them, some of them tried to say, Oh, do stop killing the Catholics, stop attacking the Catholics, because we also believe in freedom, we also believe in America, and so on. But it didn't work, they killed them anyway. And so, Bishop Dagger John Hughes was not conciliatory. Bishop Dagger John Hughes spoke clearly the truth. And that's why he was called Dagger John. And there is, this, is, this is what is required in our times. When we are in a great battle, there is a time when there is proper to say uh, to humble words, so to speak. And there is a time when it is proper to be bold. And the battle is the time to be bold. St. Uh, Saint Louis uh, of France, St. Louis IX, he was a very gentle and a very humble king. But he said, when you are in battle, and you are fighting the Muslims, Take your sword and put it through his belly with great strength. And put your full force into it so you don't have to waste and do it twice because there are more Muslims where that one came from. <laughs> that is the way he fought in battle. The gentle king. When it is a time of battle, it is a time to fight. And there are times of war, as sacred scripture tells us, <laughs> it's a time for war and a time for peace. It's a time for all things. But in the time in which the faith is being attacked, in the time in which people are tempted to be careful, in the time of excessive prudence, this is the time to be bold. And this is the time now. This is the time. The great temptation that is coming to traditional Catholics at our time is that we have to be prudent, we have to be patient, we have to be careful. And if you're too prudent, too patient, and too careful, you will die. You know that they have these, these uh, uh, places in America and all over the West where people go and they learn how martial arts and they get a black belt and they train them. You know, that, but when you go, when you do martial arts fighting, you fight for points. So when you, when you punch a guy, you hit him in the chest and as soon as you hit him, then you pull back. 
and then they practice their little martial arts, and they're really good at moving their feet and moving their arms, and then they start to think they're very powerful. So then they go in the inner cities of America, and they meet a criminal who doesn't know anything about martial arts, but he knows how to kill people. <laughs> he doesn't know anything, he ever did any training, but he knows how to cut open flesh, and he knows how to kick somebody's head in. But he knows how to really do it. They know all the moves. And so what happens is they start to do their moves. They just say what happens is even when you're in a real fight, you know you're in a real fight now. I'm in a real fight, so now I've got to punch hard. But because you were trained to stop the punch as soon as you hit, even though you're, you're, you're afraid and you're in a fight, it just comes automatically. You hit the guy and you stop. You go, what was that? <laughs> he doesn't train like that. He only knows how to fight. And so, so many of these black belts who got their degree, little paper says black belt, they go and meet one criminal. And then they go to the grave. It is not the time for punching without punch. Not the time for kicking without kicking. It is a time for fighting. We have to stand boldly for the faith and for the truth, condemn clearly the errors, and we cannot have a false prudence. And recognize this when you're dealing with the enemies of God. If you are gentle, too gentle with them, these men that are trying to destroy the Catholic Church, they will twist and turn and wrap you in inside and out and twist you in all kinds of different ways and destroy, destroy you. But we must stand boldly and clearly. Are you going to, all you have to do is compromise a little bit and we're going to give you a greater approval. No, absolutely not. Archers de Lefebvre stood up boldly alone against Rome. What happened? The Latin Mass spread throughout the Catholic Church. Why? Because of the boldness of Archbishop Lefebvre standing alone against Rome. He did not compromise. And when they asked him, you know, to the protocol of 88, he said this was a trap. It would have destroyed us. It, was, it would have been Operation Suicide, he said in the confirmation, in the ordination, consecration sermons of June 30th, 88, had we gone along with this protocol. He said in June of that, of, of just before the consecrations, had we gone along with this agreement, had we persevered and gone to the point of an agreement, this would have been the death of the Society of St. Pius X and the death of Catholic tradition. We would have had to compromise. And then what did he say about the paternity of St. Peter? About the priests that left the society, who went and made a deal with Rome. He says, they have betrayed us. They have betrayed Catholic tradition, because they're shaking hands with the modernists. You do not shake hands with the enemies of Christ. They are the enemies of Christ. And Father Bolick, an old American priest, was ordained in the early days of the society in 1974, and was one of the big, big, big uh, developers of the United States District. He just died last year. But in his last sermon, a little 20-minute sermon that's good to listen to, it says one time one of the priests or bishops was speaking to him. He says, don't you, don't you pray for the church? Don't, I mean, don't you pray for the bishops? Don't you pray for the priests? He goes, yes. I pray for the enemies of the church every day. <laughs> they are the enemies. We have to pray for our enemies. We are told we ought to pray for our enemies, but let's not make it, let's not be confused. These modern bishops and this modern pope is an enemy of the church. Pope Francis is an enemy of the church. He is using his papacy in order to destroy the Catholic Church, washing the feet of women, or washing the feet of Muslims, trying to change the papacy into some kind of uh, ecumenical, uh, I mean, a uh, uh, democratic office. So you've, Four years Pope, and then you go get reelected for four more years, and you start a campaign, and so on. The papal campaign. He has, he has made a decision. He's going to uh, prepare a huge celebration in, 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 in 2017, where the Lutherans and the Catholics will come together to celebrate the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's uh, 95 theses being nailed to the door of the Wittenberg, and that he's going to celebrate the beginning of Protestantism. It's going to be a 500 year celebration and he's going to try to make the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches come together to be one church at that time. We're going to become more ecumenical. That's what he's working on, Pope Francis. But what are some priests of the society saying about him? Well, he's moderate. He's not moderate, he's just an enemy of God. 
He is not doing what he should be doing as Pope. We have to pray for his conversion. But when you pray for someone's conversion, it means you recognize that they are not living as they should live. They are not living a Catholic life. They are not teaching the Catholic truth. They are gone away from the church. Many people in the family have sons and daughters that have gone away from the church. And we pray for their conversion. We pray for their return to God. Because we know that when you're living with a man that is not your husband, or you're living with a woman that is not your wife, or nowadays living with a homosexual partner, you are living an enemy of God. Very simple. And you have to pray for the conversion. You don't pray that they uh, become accepted. You pray that they become converted and that they change. And we now have a Pope. And we have bishops that are actively working to destroy the kingdom of Christ. That's what they're doing. What they, whether they intended or not, only God knows. The doctors of Napoleon fed him cyanide. They fed him arsenic. Why did they do it? Because they thought that by giving small amounts of poison, they could kill the disease and save Napoleon. They probably went straight to heaven, but so did Napoleon. He died because of the doctors. The doctors wanted to save him. And they gave him poison in order to save him, because that's how doctors think. <laughs> now the fact is that it didn't work. Now the doctors meant well, they're very nice and loving doctors, and Napoleon is dead. <laughs> It doesn't matter. Poison has poisonous effects. Whether you like it or you don't like it, believe it or don't believe it. So what is happening right now, the Pope and the bishops are doing poisonous things to the church. They are poisoning the church. They might think that it's medicine. Maybe they're reaching in the cabinet and pulling out arsenic, thinking they're pulling out Tylenol. And then they're handing out arsenic pills, thinking they're handing out Tylenol pills. But they're not. The poison has poisonous effects. And what is in their hearts, only God knows. What is in their souls, only God knows. And what they are doing is that which is destructive to the Catholic Church, and it must be condemned. As St. Saint Saint Paul says, he resisted St. Peter to the face. Why to the face? Because he needed to be reproved. Sometimes the superior needs to be reproved. Because the superior is operating against God. And the superior is doing something against the common good, not just private. If the superior is doing something privately wicked, you pray for the superior, but you don't expose him. But if the superior is doing something publicly wicked, which is destructive to souls or destructive to the common good, then he has to be publicly rebuked. And that is the case. St. John the Baptist would have had a more peaceful life if he didn't rebuke Herod. But he did rebuke him. The same is true of so many of the saints, rebuking wicked kings, rebuking those that were heretics. That's what we must do. And now, what is it that is required of the new society of St. Pius X? Positive commentaries. Gentle approaches. Avoid polemics. Avoid conflict. Avoid negative terminology. Because the devil knows that in a battle, there are two ways to win. One part of the victory is to take your gun and shoot the enemy. Another way to win is to have your enemy not shoot at you. If they don't shoot at you, they don't have anything to worry about. If you're attacking them with machine guns, and they're shooting back with water pistols, you don't have much to worry about. And so that one of the ways of getting the battle to ensure victory is to make sure that the enemies of hell and the enemies of sin and the enemies of heresy, the enemies of lies, don't speak against sin, heresy, and lies. Look at the new sspx.org and dg.org. It gets worse every day. Worse every day. Creating confusion for souls. Confusion. The latest one, you know, Cardinal Schoenberg, you know, is, uh, you know, and this other car Cardinal, whatever his name is, is very sincere in speaking against homosexuality. Uh, another one is not sincere, and this is SSPX speaking. Pope Francis, the commentary of Father Lorenz on Pope Francis. Pope Francis is a, uh, you know, there are some people that say that Francis, uh, that, uh, you know, that they, that, 
They don't. The, some Vatican watchers think this. Some Vatican watchers think that. But it doesn't explain what it is that they think. Others think they know everything, when in fact they're only confused. And he doesn't say anything. But we do know. Father Lene told Father Giselle last week, or just or just just a few days ago, or a few a week and a half ago. He said that you know you're judging the Pope too early. He's only been a Pope for the month. How do you know what kind of Pope he's going to be? He's been very busy in his first month. He's been extremely busy. During the course of his first month, he's refused to move the papal apartments. During the course of the first month, he's wiped the, the washed the feet of the women and of the uh, uh, what do you call it, even the Muslims. During the course of the first month, he had his inaugural mass with, the, of course, all the women readers and so on. He gave Holy Communion to uh, Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden who are uh, pro-homosexual, pro-gay marriage, and pro-abortion, public pro-homosexual, pro-abortion, and pro-gay marriage uh, candidates. And they were and well known throughout the world for this, and he gave them personally Holy Communion. That's called giving communion to public sinners. And then, and then also, uh, he's, he's, he's teaching absolute modernism. He also, in the course of the first month, is already planning for a 500-year anniversary with the Protestants. He has made it very clear he will not wear the papal regalia. He doesn't like to give blessings. He re refused to give a blessing to the uh, reporters. He says, I'm not going to bless you in the name of the cross because it will offend some of you. So uh, I'm just going to say, let's bow our heads and pray for blessings. When he became Pope, and he was a Pope for about 30 seconds, he came out on the balcony and he asked for the blessing of the people. And Father Hugo says, don't forget to send your blessing to the Pope when you get your spare time. Send your blessing to the Pope. He doesn't realize that the priest is the one who carries blessings. The one we ordain priests, the bishop puts his hand, consecrates our hands with the holy oil. He says, what these hands bless, it shall be blessed. What these hands consecrate, it shall be consecrated. Which means other hands don't have the power to bless. And other hands don't have the power to consecrate. But the Pope doesn't know that. And he's the Pope. He's asking for the blessing of the people. And so these things are grave, most grave, serious, most serious, and he's covered a lot of territory in 30 days. And yet, what does the Father say? Father Lene says, well, you're being too judgy. You don't even know what he's going to do yet. We know what he's done. And what he has done is wicked. What he has done is against God. What he has done is, uh, is destroying the Catholic Church. And what he has done is in perfect harmony with his predecessor, Pope Benedict. And don't forget that every sin committed by Pope Francis, Pope Benedict is guilty. Don't forget that. Because Pope Benedict quit. Pope Benedict retired. He decided to quit and go into retirement. Why did he do that? To change the papacy. His friend was then elected Pope afterwards. He, was, he retired in order to change the papacy, and he has changed, he believes he has changed the face of the papacy to make it more like uh, Vatican II. Pope Benedict is the one who is to blame. And now what is happening? We find traditional Catholics saying, oh, I wish for the good old days back when Pope Benedict was the Pope. It's very much like the Jews. We read about the Jews wandering in the desert, when those Jews were wandering in the desert for 40 years, the old Jews were talking to the young ones. Oh boy, the onions in Egypt, they were so good. Now we're stuck with this manna, eating manna every day and quail every day. I'm sick of manna, I'm sick of quail. But the onions, the onions were so good in Egypt. It tells us in the book of Exodus, they longed for the onions of Egypt. There they were in the desert, taken away from their slavery, taken away from the... From the, from the uh, uh, the evil uh, Pharaoh, taken away from a wicked and horrible life, and they long for the onions. They forgot about the murderers, they forgot about the other little details. And so it is now with traditional Catholics. They are longing for the onions of Benedict. We had such good onions under Benedict. He made such wonderful promises that he never fulfilled. He, made, he was such a conservative Pope who went to the Jewish synagogue more times in seven years than Pope John Paul II was able to do in 27 years. He did more ecumenical acts, more wicked acts, in the short papacy that he had than John Paul II was able to do over 27 years. 
And he was the one responsible for the deception of the 2007 and 2009 acts, bringing the death to Catholic tradition, which will not be the true death, but the apparent death. The so-called, uh, the Sumorum Pontificum, saying that the, the never abrogated, that the old Mass was never abrogated. And yet you can't have this never abrogated Mass unless you accept Vatican II, and unless you accept the new Mass. Spoken to many society priests about this 2007 wicked text, Sumorum Pontificum, which is worse than the indole of 84. And many priests have said, well, you know, it's true, it's not a, it's not a perfect document. Not a perfect document. And so, but he said never abrogated. What has been the result of the 2007 document? There's been a decline of many of our parishes throughout the world. Before 2007, people would go from the indult to the SSPX. The indult became a stepping stone to the SSPX. You go from the Novus Ordo, you go to the Endo. Many and many faithful told me, I went to the Latin Mass, I thought it was nice, I wanted to go to the Latin Mass. But then I realized, there's no meat, there's no substance. Because they're not teaching the clear faith, and that's why I left the Endo and came to the society. It was a stepping stone. Now it's the other way around. Both falls alone, we've lost about 300 people that go into the Endo. We've lost another 100, 152 people in Richfield, Connecticut. And all throughout the society, there are so many cases of many, many faithful leaving our chapels and going to the indults since 2007. Previous to 2007, it was the other way. Now it's the wrong way. And priests are saying, it's okay. Go ahead and go to the indult. In Washington, D.C., for instance, Father Ortiz told me, and Father Ringrose checked, they have 15 young, 15 people that stopped going to Father Ringrose's Mass because he did a very wicked act. He supported the resistance. He received us into his house. And uh, he signed a document that said that he believes in the teachings of Archbishop Lefebvre and the 1974 Declaration, and that he's against modernism, which, of course, is a very, 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 very wicked thing to do in this time. And so, therefore, the society, of uh, the seminary, the priest comes from the seminary once a month to Washington, D.C., the same as in a hotel, so that the, the, these people don't have to be exposed to the wickedness of Father Ringrose and Father Ortiz in the parish of uh, St. Athanasius in, in Vienna, Virginia, because he will talk about things like modernism is bad and things like that. Therefore, we cannot go to his mass because he doesn't approve of the new direction of Bishop Fillet, and he has even indirectly and in small ways criticized Bishop Fillet, which is entirely excessive, and therefore he cannot be tolerated. Those people go to the indult mass on the other weeks. So on the one Sunday, they go to the Society Mass in the Holiday Inn. The other Sundays, they go to the Indo. They don't go to Father Ringrose and uh, Father Ortiz anymore. And so it's Indo Society. It used to be, it's, this is part of the slide. Some people go to the Indo and the New Mass. Now they go Indo Society. The society it was always the enemy of the Indo before. Now we have become brothers. Bishop Fillet called us brothers last year. There is confusion. But in the truth is not confused. The truth is clear. The acceptance of the new Mass is wicked. Bishop Fillet says in April, we are still against the new Mass. April of 2013. But he also says, in his April document of last year, that he accepts the new Mass. He doesn't retract his acceptance of the new Mass. So he both accepts and he doesn't accept. Which one is it? Well, there's only one message of truth, not two. And now we're finding a mix. We're finding a mix. But this is a time very similar to the time of the apostles, when the mass is being said in houses, when there's only a few that are following the truth, and they're outnumbered by the world around them. But it is necessary that when we stand for the truth, to stand for it boldly, to condemn the errors clearly, and to have confidence in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and our Holy Church. We have to have confidence in those things. They will, our Lord will give the victory in His own time. And we have to have confidence. And we have to continue to move forward, preaching the truth that we have always preached. And it is interesting, the SSPX, I am preaching the same as I have always preached. 
Father Chazelle is preaching the same as he always preached. Father Hugo the same as he always preached. Father Ortiz the same as he always preached. But we're expelled now. Bishop Williamson, always the same. He never changes. And is expelled now. How did it happen? We haven't changed. But we are now expelled because the organization has changed. Because the direction of the organization has changed. Because the leadership of the organization has changed. And most importantly, the principles of the organization has changed. And we have to continue to condemn the errors. Continue to preach the truth. Continue to speak up against public acts of the authorities that are going against God. And leading souls, leading the sheep down the path to destruction. Leading souls to hell. And whenever we compromise the faith, it endangers souls. And we are seeing the slide everywhere in our parishes. We are seeing the slide. Our schools, more and more people are pulling their children out. St. Mary's has 750 children in the school. When I was there 25 years ago, there were 500 children in the school. 25 years have passed. Now there's 750. And the parish is 10 times bigger, or four, no, well, 5 times bigger than when I was there, or only there as a border. And then a few years ago, there were 900 children in the school. In St. Mary's, Kansas. Now there's 700. Why do we find this dropping? And the dropping is happening in so many places. The pews are getting more empty. But they don't want to see it. The schools are getting smaller. But they don't want to see it. The people are going over to the end adult. But they don't want to see it. And they even say it's okay. Priests are being expelled. Priests are being thrown out. And yet we have more priests in many areas than we used to. But they're not saying the masses. They're not doing the work that they used to. We are a dying society. Open your eyes and see. The SSPX is in the process of dying. And the only answer is to bring back truth and charity. These things have to be brought back. And right now they're disappearing from the SSPX. And we have to stand firmly for the truth. And we need a few bold souls that are willing to stand up. You must speak to your priests. So many faithful are worried about what's going on, but they won't talk to the priests. And they won't even talk to the fellow faithful. Priests are worried. And priests have told me they're worried also, but they don't even talk to the fellow priests in the priory. Now when you sit at the table, you're sitting there and you're looking, what is he thinking? <laughs> is he going to turn me in? We never thought those things before. We never worried about being turned in before. We have become like a communist organization. And this is what's happening. How do you fight it? Fight it. You don't fight it by saying, my name is www.mrananimous.com, fighting against all the people in the world. It is necessary to fight as a man. We stand up and fight clearly. We fight boldly. We don't shoot as phantoms. We shoot clearly and boldly. We fight with our, with our souls. If www.anonymous.com doesn't go to heaven, there's no anonymous souls in heaven. There are real souls in heaven and real souls in hell. And we cannot always be fighting with anonymity. And we think that we're standing so strong because we're Mr. Anonymous this and Mr. Anonymous that. So many anonymous people are talking to me that I've lost track of which one's which. <laughs> and so, we're not operating in anonymity. We operate standing on our names, standing on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, standing on the name of our Holy Church, standing with confidence. And we're very much like the time of the early apostles, so let's pray that we have the faith of those apostles and recognize that victory is going to be given and have complete confidence in Our Lady, she will give the victory. And we'll close with that, God bless you all, in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Absolutely.